Do you ever wake up some days and just worry? You know, like, you wake up at the start of the day telling yourself that it's just going to be a bad day. You're constantly living on the edge of your seat through that day in question. It's almost like you're just actively looking for trouble and just like that, something bad happens. A chain of events that just keeps getting worse and worse throughout the day. It all triggered when you woke up and told yourself, okay, today is going to be a bad day. Just one bad day, right? A long day that you wish you could just pinch yourself to get out of, kind of like a bad dream for example. But what if you could do that? Just pinch yourself to get out of this hellish, terrible, bad day. Meet Hajime Isayama, a mangaka from Oita Oyama, Japan. Isayama was very interested in the concept of dreams. Both dreams, nightmares, and video games were something that he saw as an inspiration for his stories that he would concoct during his days in high school. After graduating, he matriculated into the manga design program of the arts department at Kyushu designer Gakken. In 2006, he applied for the Magazine Grand Prix, also known as the MGP, which was promoted by Kodansha Limited. Of course, winning the competition would allow him to gain the Fine Creators Award and kickstart his dream of pursuing a full-blown career in writing manga. Of course, he'd find out how truly cruel the industry can be to those who lack in certain and specific areas. At the time of his early stages while writing manga, Isayama's work was a little lacking in terms of quality. That's something that he would often get shut down with when approaching different publication companies. He tried to reach them far and wide but to no avail, one of which being the rather popular weekly Shonen Jump, but once again, his work was just turned down on multiple occasions. The story for your manga is for sure an interesting one. It's just we don't think you'll be good enough to fit in at our workplace. I won't sugarcoat it. We can't have you work here amongst our group of artists. Listen, your concept isn't that bad. It's just we've seen better. And over time he came right back around full circle to the company that actually gave him his very first chance, Kodansha. Funnily enough, Isayama at this point was somewhat of a broken man. His confidence and almost his patience were entirely crushed, stating in an interview with BBC News. My self esteem was so low when the editor said he liked my work. I remember thinking, what is wrong with this guy? After roaming the country to find a magazine to publish his work, Kodansha more than politely accepted the man into their ranks and so he was slid into the Bigsatsu Shonen magazine where the first chapter of his series, Attack on Titan, was published. As dystopian as the fictional world of Attack on Titan appears, the culture, cowardice and mentality of its inhabitants as well as the Titans themselves draw striking parallels to our own reality. Determination, fear, happiness, relief, selfishness and of course, revenge. Circling back however, revenge is something that can be arguably fueled by determination. What better way to explore the mindset of revenge than to introduce our main character, Eren Jäger. Is Eren Yeager a complicated, deep character from the get-go? No, 
Not really. At the start of Halves of the series, Aaron Yeager is a direct character. He wants to kill all the Titans because he lost his hometown and mother because of them. It's quite literally that simple. Aaron does not like close-minded people because they're less willing to be able to make and change and free everyone. Aaron is impulsive, caring, honestly direct, stubborn, resilient, and also human. There's nothing complex about that. However, what people tend to forget about Aaron is that Aaron also has a good brain. Not as good as Armin's, of course, but still. Aaron has a feel-good layer on him that is still rather easily read. At least that's what I would say if we were referring to Aaron's life as a young boy. The early years of Aaron's life as a soldier was somewhat rather easy to follow, somewhat bland as a main character so to speak. I feel like that's where a lot of complaints about Aaron's character originally came from in the early stages of the series. His whole mindset was something that was obviously resembling a whiny, cocky, arrogant child with his head stuck in the clouds. His determination-ridden personality was something that hardly passed as charming, and you'd be lucky to even deduce that from his character in the early stages if I'm being truthful with you. But as the story progresses, and as Aaron grows up, in a way, Aaron has a complex personality. He's seeing things more in grey than just black and white. Despite being harder to read, he's more quiet about his intentions. Aaron still is the same character. Yes, he's able to take lives without blinking an eye, but Aaron still deeply cares about the ones close to him. Even though he did hurt Mikasa and Armin with the words and his fists, I always believed that Aaron was thinking of the bigger picture when he did this. He always thought about the bigger picture. Aaron was a lot more hard to understand at this moment of the story because he wasn't as vocal about what he had been doing and why. Still, I believed his goal was still the same since Wall Maria got attacked. The first time we see this evolution in Eren's character is the Marley invasion. This arc as a whole I had always saw as Isayama trying to get the reader to develop a sense of Stockholm Syndrome, while obviously with the opposing side. Stockholm Syndrome is usually used in the case of kidnappers becoming emotionally sympathetic towards their victims, or victims feeling a sense of radical compliance with their captors to side with them. However, in this case, we can take a look at it here as the watcher slash reader bonding and choosing to believe in the opposing side. The opposing side obviously being at this time in the reader watcher's eyes, Reiner, Zeke and the island of Marley as a whole. We see them dealing with their own personal conflicts, fighting their own personal battles to keep their home turf safe. There's a phrase that always works very very well in this case, that being one man's terrorist is another man's freedom fighter. This is a lesson that, of course, is a sad one to think about and a god-awful one to put into perspective given our current political climate, but in the end, that's just how things are. It's a kill-or-be-killed world. One could say a eat-or-be-eaten world, if you see what I did there. However, Attack on Titan had always been portraying these themes a lot more radically in the earlier halves of the series. I say radically here but in the little sense of titans themselves, they represent that eat or be eaten concept. All starting with the event we previously skimmed over, the death of Carla Jaeger. This is where a young naive Eren got moulded into the man he formed to become at the end of the series, with him and Mikasa witnessing the death of their mother, and with Harness showing the true desperation of the soldiery system. These chains of events were debatably what shaped Attack on Titan into the series it formed to after years of publication. Revenge and corruption. Arguably, these themes weave into each other as things progress, Eren literally being used as a billboard for the interlining of these themes. Of course, as much as you look into it, Eren since this point on is a broken boy, that broken boy being left unrepaired, eventually growing to become a broken man. Well written protagonists and creatures are usually purely formed by the worlds they inhabit, their backstories being pure definition of their future actions. They may turn out to be morally good, bad, or even realistic by our world standards. Their actions make perfect sense within their world, within the context of their backstories. A fine example of this would be Guts, the main character of Kentaro Miura's Berserk. On the other hand, the actions of a poorly written protagonist does not 
sync with their world, resulting in their motivations and choices usually being all over the place. Erin belongs of course in the former category. Erin's goals, motives and character as a whole are shaped by the world that he's written into. It's these themes that Isayama tries to portray in the series that envelops Erin. I think through taking all of this into account and into perspective, it makes me respect Erin's earlier iteration a lot more than I initially did. It adds a natural layer and depth to his character that makes it evident to people who have paid attention to the story of Attack on Titan and who hasn't. It's difficult to imagine how a world plagued with suffering by giant humanoid flesh-eating monsters could compare to our contemporary reality, yet the illusions remain unmistakable, not just using the titans as a basis here, but the way society works as well. In a story, the social structure stands as a central conflict in the series. Poorer citizens and military grunts live in the more condensed housing, closer to the outer wall. Eren's family's living conditions prove this. Even though Eren's father, Grisha, obviously appears to be a scholarly man, their home is not just only a bungalow, but is also cramped quarters, butting amongst other homes, similar to a city planning for a slum or a project. In contrast, Wall Rose, the walled city behind theirs, it's a lot more luxurious, and the interior is even more so. Higher ranking officers and nobles live in the interior, far from any imminent titan attacks, in the mansions or the castles. Making the poor and the less affluent the first line of defence against monsters may seem cruel or even evil, but it almost perfectly mimics the social system our civilised society has to live in. In the reality we all share, Poor people are usually reduced to living in slums and ghettos, the only type of housing they can afford. In such situations, you have the very desperate preying on the distute monsters, as intimidating as titans forming gangs, using murder, prostitution, thievery and drugs, and innocent blood to feed themselves. While the less fortunate scourge to survive on the outer walls, where are the rich, the leaders and the powerful? They reside in the interior behind the gated communities, suburbs and country mansions, far from danger. It's this area, this cattle-like setting that we see Aaron complain about the most, wanting to free himself from this boring life of his. Dreams of seeing the ocean, for example. Character development is integral to a good story. The person you see at the end of the story cannot be the person you meet at the beginning. There has to be a tangible change, progress and transformation. When good protagonists are conceived, writers usually leave a space to develop within them. How that development shapes up depends on the story, of course. In Aaron's case, this development has been obvious. He's not just the same character we saw in the first half of the story. He evolved into someone else. Someone intriguing and compelling. I believe that it was obvious for Eren to be somewhat, um, how do I put this without sounding like a complete simpleton here? A, a, a little bit unlikable is the word I'm looking for. Yes, of course, at the beginning stages of the story it was designed for you to feel sympathy for Eren, and yes, in moments you couldn't help but smile at his cheeky personality and boyish charm as he pushed through with the determination of a boy trying to make change in the world. There was a certain innocence within that, but of course, with all that in mind, it could also be perceived as somewhat of an arrogant outlook. The blatant arrogance causing a reaction from the viewer that could possibly project Eren as a little bit unlikable in the first act of the series, because it's with this key word, arrogance, that we can see how Eren's lust for freedom, moreover somewhat revenge, takes a turn for the bitter. Yes, Eren did begin from a position of rage. Yes, he did have an obsession with annihilating the titans, yes, he did show signs of a black and white morality that makes it easier to deploy the violence that he does. But the narrative is set up that his experiences lead him to evolve, first as a soldier who comes to face to face with the corruption of his human society and unfairness of the system, and then as a person who watches his entire conception of the world shatter. I think the first instance that we saw this become noticeable is with Hannes, family friend of the Jaegers and most importantly the squad captain of Wall Maria's garrison unit, the squad that was placed to maintain the walls in that area. Fleeing and trying to save Carla from her impending doom as a titan slowly marches its way towards her and aims to gobble her up like a midday snack. 
We see soldiers as humanity's best of the best when it comes to the line of defence, and what are we greeted with when Harness is flung into position of genuine life-saving importance? His bottle crashes. His mind breaks under the weight of possibly putting his own life on the line and runs away with Eren and Mikasa in his arms, resembling the form of a coward somewhat. He had to take the kids of course, he couldn't let his entire level of pride be crushed on that day, could he? The second development in particular is thoroughly game-changing. Once the truth of the world is revealed in fullness, it forces Eren to re-evaluate his world view. It completely changes Eren's relationship with his arch-nemesis, the Titans. Given that the series is categorised as a shonen series, a portion of the audience would probably tend to think that Eren's journey is nothing but a series of levelling up, gaining new powers and skills and becoming stronger and stronger with every arc. But I'm sorry to say that this is nothing but a simplistic thought process while reading the series. Of course, yes, he is the main fucking character. He's of course going to be learning new abilities and gaining skills and so on, but it's each one of these skills and abilities that bear a real weight with them. There's a series of traumatic thoughts and horrific visions that sparks him inside, and it's these sparks that only continue to develop into an unquenchable flame throughout his goal of achieving true freedom. It's not really a matter of these upgrades to his strength that unsheath his true potential as a force to be reckoned with, but it's rather about breaking the metaphorical shackles that chained him down as a person. At this point, he's a broken boy on the cusp of manhood. We're seeing the Eren we questioned the personality of so much, the one that we developed a love and hate relationship for, turn into a man that we somewhat begin to fear within the story. A man that's been nothing but tainted and mentally poisoned since adolescence. Of course, this was foreshadowed long, long ago. From the point in the story I'm referencing now, I'd like to talk to you for a brief moment about Reiner Braun, a man that Eren himself deemed his equal, the other side of his double-sided coin. In the early stages of the story, Reiner Braun is presented to be a character that Eren can somewhat look up to and confide in. Every series has them. You know, those, those big brother type characters, but not really the big brother type characters. The, the main character's comfort character, I, I suppose, is the best way I can put it. It's when we take that in and put that into perspective that we truly feel the weight of the traitor reveal scene, shown way back in Season 2, Episode 6, or Chapter 42 of the manga. It's here that we can develop such a strong, justifiable hate for not only Reiner, but Bertolt Hoover as well. Reiner, specifically, though, having been given much more screen time and overall being shaping up to be this big brother-like figure to Eren's character. Or can we? See, Reiner is arguably one of, if not the biggest victimised character in the story of Attack on Titan. Reiner Braun was born from a relationship between an Eldian mother and a Marlian father. His birth was the result of a prohibited union due to the fact that the Eldians were hated throughout the world for being descendants of Ymir Fritz. To be able to see his father, Reiner aimed to join Marley's warriors along with Berthold, Annie, Marcel, Porco and Pake. He was quite weak, a frail young man who quite frankly didn't seem to have a lot going for him in terms of rankings when it came to the importance of inheriting one of the nine. Of course, it was all thanks to his childhood friend Marcel Galliard that he was able to weasel away with being gifted the power of the Armoured Titan, a figure that not only resembled that of power, but one of protection, defence, and of course, honour. Honour the only a true warrior could uphold. And of course, before leaving for the mission to Paradise Island, he met his father. His father, however, hating him as he did not resemble the symbol of honour to him, nor did he resemble power, protection, or defence. No, all he resembled in his father's eyes was trouble, the byproduct of two people who were never meant to be. Reiner, to his father, was nothing but the unfortunate result of a forbidden relationship. Of course, Reiner was broken by this. 
The very man he was supposed to look up to in life, be taught valuable lessons by, saw him as nothing but a stain. Even so, he went on the mission to retrieve the founding titan and the walls. Of course, you obviously know how the events unfold here. Marcel being eaten alive by the unevolved titanic Ymir, and after Marcel courageously saved Reiner's life, this resulted in Reiner, Annie and Beltholt to escape the nightmarish scene. It was after this that Annie and Beltholt showed more than enough interest in abandoning the mission and retreating back home, but an adrenaline infused Reiner had convinced them to stay and act out the mission like they originally intended. It was at this very moment that you could say Reiner's schizophrenic tendencies started to form, two personalities being moulded in his head purely to be able to mask the failures that haunted him. We have Warrior Reiner, and we have Soldier Reiner. On surface value, yes, they do sound rather similar in the theme, I'm aware. The first being his original personality, while the second being an almost scarily accurate imitation of Marcel Galliard, a man that forced and convinced himself to think that he was a soldier designed for nothing more than to carry out the mission, the mission that he had brainwashed himself to believe was protecting the walls. Until he had that mental fucking breakdown, of course, which we mentioned, is when he reveals himself to be the traitor, the armoured titan, along with Beltholt revealing himself in turn as the colossal titan. This scene here has a little bit more symbolism to it. It's through this that the previously mentioned multiple personality problem that Reiner had been facing had fully finished its maturing process. In a more metaphorical outlook, he developed a bipolar disorder to be able to fulfil his mission. Reiner. It was an armour, not literally like his titan, but mental and spiritual. This is the most intriguing part of Reiner's character. His build is full of complications and contradictions. Since he was an arrogant child who was manipulated by a ignorant government and a ignorant mother, Reiner didn't know that what he did was wrong until it was too late. He killed many people, he destroyed the door to Shiganshina, he insisted his friends to fulfil the mission and he murdered Marco in a ruthless manner. But he is passionate, humble and strong. When he genuinely believed he was a soldier, he acted like an older brother to Eren, saved Connie's life, genuinely cared for Krista and really cared for Berthold, his best friend of course. In a slight discourse, we come to find that with Berthold, the so-called treachery against the island of Paradise was also referenced with his sleeping position, Reiner dubbing it as the clear skies position. But of course, if we take a deeper look into this, there's obviously a lot more to it. Yeah. Surprise, surprise, I know. This position of his actually represents the tarot card, The Hanged Man. It depicts a Petura Infamante, a genre of defamatory painting and relief commonly used in Renaissance Italy. It's an image of a man being hanged upside down by one ankle, the only exception, the Tarocco Siliciano, which depicts the man being hanged by the neck instead. This method of hanging was commonly used as punishment at the time for traitors, and yes, if we take a look at the positioning of the drawing on the card, we can see how the man is. We can draw obvious comparisons here to Bertolt's pose in his bed. Well, um, <clears throat> you, you know, that and the fact that his story in episode 3 was a complete lie, taking on the old man's story that they had met in the village and using it as a cover story. Themes of suicide by hanging and all that, but um, yeah, Reiner. Four years after the Battle of Shiganshina, Reiner's split personalities had ended up merging into one. Although hard for some, it seemed like the story here had flipped in many, many ways. When coming to the rematch after the infiltration, the vision you can somewhat get here is that Reiner has evolved into the quote-unquote hero of the story, while Eren, of course, is being viewed as a villainous figure. Reiner's motivation was, and still is, to save Gabby and Falco and overall fight for his people. Finally, we can see him as a noble soldier that is the embodiment of the things that we mentioned earlier, a symbol of honour, power, protection and determination. Right? While Reiner is a deep and well thought out character that perfectly portrays the essence of victimisation, I doubt that anyone could just straight up call him a hero or even morally correct and take our knowledge 
of Molly and all the past forms of our initially perceived enemy's perspective, I can say that no side in Attack on Titan could be deemed as morally correct. But as we take the literal act of war into consideration, even in our real life scenarios and cases, the fact is that nothing new can really be drawn from this. And of course, taking all of this into consideration, where does the foreshadowing come into play? A training exercise on a base camp in Season 1, Episode 4 to be specific. Reiner Braun simply handing Aaron Yeager a practice knife, showing us that the way before we were given any details of Reiner turning against them or Aaron evolving into a war-torn boy trapped in an unforgiving cynical man's body, that this is how it was going to be. This is how Isayama was hinting to us, the handing down of the torch, so to speak, showing us the change in positions that was yet to come at that time. Reiner initially going from the attacking position to a self-defending act, and of course with Eren, vice versa. The main question that we are left with now is, am I reaching on that? Of course, to answer your question, yeah. There's a really fucking good chance that I could be. And while, yes, it's not exactly set in stone that this sequence truly means anything, it is just some really cool coincidence that could mean something. And at the end of the day, there's no harm in theorising, right? Well, this is YouTube at the end of the day, so I'm sure that there are some consequences that fucking comes with that, but... Anyway, Attack on Titan's characters are the result of many well thought out themes and morals that are weaved into its story, plenty of which is actually being used as an example to highlight Eren's evolution. The best one that actually highlights this is a rather controversial one, and regardless of how you may feel about them, the expertise of their writing is undeniable. That character being, drumroll please, Gabby Braun. Gabby Braun is, um, is one of the, uh, look, she's probably the best written female character in Attack on Titan, despite being the most hated, by far, and in some ways it is understandable she did cause the death of a fan favourite character, and her overall personality isn't exactly particularly appealing. As a whole, however, we are in no position to overall hate Gabby. Yes, she messed up things and yes, her actions did create a stirring turmoil in the fanbase. However, in the end, Gabby is just... Eren. Let me explain. Gabby's introduction as a character was that of a hot-headed, determined, and overly confident young girl who placed a lot of pride in herself and her abilities, and this could be quite annoying. However, this brash and cocky young girl showed very similar traits to a certain someone, that someone being, of course, our Eren Jaeger. At the time of when she was introduced, compared to Eren's rather younger years, their character traits were nearly identical to one another. She was Marley's Eren Jaeger, a carbon copy of the boy that we had begun to realise was no longer within our reach. Gabby, much like Eren, has placed an immense amount of belief in herself. If I'm being truthful, on surface level, given our knowledge, it was almost an unrealistic amount. It is in her mind that she would be the one to defeat the enemy, that she would be the one to win the war, that she would be the one to kill them all. Every last one of them. If one can remember, Eren too was like that as a child. Angry, reckless, all the traits that Gabby holds, basically. And if you look into the root of their motivation, of their drive and unfaltering, wild, passion and insanity, one can see a deep hatred for the other side. Eren despised the titans who took away his mother, Gabby despised the quote Eldian devils who caused quote unquote good Eldian devils like her to suffer. And it was then through this that both of them experienced the pinnacle of loss amongst their respective groups. For Eren it was the fall of Shiganshina, and for Gabby it was the fall of the internment zone of Libero. The exact same thing that has happened to our protagonist is happening to her. However, when she gets the retaliation by killing Sasha, people hate her for it. Why? 
because we've been following these characters since the very beginning. They're the squad that we've known and loved for over, technically, near enough a whole decade at this point. If the positions were flipped and we followed Gabby from the start, then it becomes very, very easy to put things into perspective. It would have been this little girl trying to become a warrior, being broken from childhood, caused by a dirty, old-looking man by the name of Eren Yeager. Do you see what I'm getting at here? Gabby was Erin, and Erin was Gabby. The final nail in the coffin is when Paik tells her the inescapable truth. She too is a subject of Ymir, she is also an Eldian. There will be no hope of being a true good Eldian. Marley will discriminate against her regardless, and once Gabby comes to terms with this, once she meets Falco, who for so long had stood by her side to try and tell her this, she is born anew. It is with this golden moment that Gabby comes to terms with the truth around her, as well as inside her. By tearing off the Marleyan armband from Falco's arm, she tears off the chains binding them to Marley and resolves to kill Eren. Not because of revenge anymore, but from something else. Just like Eren, who by this point had been clear in confronting the burden of his sins and changed his ideal. Gabby similarly does the same. Now she no longer performs the actions she does for revenge. Now she does it for those she cares about. In the mirror scene, shared both by Gabby and Erin, she, just like Erin, is tying up her hair, but she's not doing it for the sake of moving forward. Unlike Erin, her eyes do not gleam with determination to move forward, but with determination to reunite with Falco, and it's with this scene that we bear witness to the true evolution of Gabby Braun. In a complete 180 contrast compared to her older self, she has decided to go ahead and confront those of Paradise Island, and she decides to ally with them in the end. Eren, however, being determined to eradicate his enemy, but unlike him, she resolved her differences between the rivaling islands. She lets go of things like freedom and things like promise and vengeance all in aims to restore the bonds of humanity, something arguably better to strive towards in these circumstances. Gabby, as a character, was made, at least in my eyes, to highlight how much of the previous Eren that we had lost. Her character to simply highlight Eren's dark, twisted path he resulted into by spiralling, and that it isn't the only way to deal with loss. To show that Eren's idea of revenge isn't that glorious of a product as Isayama purposely advertised it as, more so an act of Eren's unchained, untamed suffering that resulted in a very noticeable act of selfishness. Her parallels with Eren Yeager help broaden the themes of perspectivism and humanity throughout the story. And despite the hatred that she's received for killing Sasha, I genuinely don't think that Gabby Braun is a bad character. I think while well, yes, it is justifiable that she would be hated somewhat given her actions in the early half of her introduction, but we all know that in his early years, if he were put in that position, Eren would do the exact same thing, and given the context, I'm sure that we would all cheer him on because he's, in the end, our boy, Eren. Or well, he was. In Attack on Titan, there are certain things that could be or usually are regularly overlooked. Of course, that is understandable. I don't think many people spend weeks on end analysing a certain chapter as if they were analysing their own fucking skin follicles or something, but undeniably, one thing that the series excels in is its references to Norse mythology, folklore, and believe it or not, numerology. First of all, I would like to bring up Ymir Fritz, the one that started it all off. Funnily enough, of course, that in itself is a pretty interesting nod to Norse mythology. Poetic Edda, the modern name for an untitled collection of old Norse mythological anonymous poems, refers to Ymir as a primeval being who was born from the venom that dripped from the icy rivers of Elivagar, and lived in the grassless void of Ginugaga. I think that's how you pronounce it. Ymir birthed a male and a female from the pits of their arms, and their legs together begated a six-headed being, eventually being killed by Odin and his two brothers, Fili and V, to become known as the creator of life. Taking this and comparing it to our Ymir Fritz, 
She was eaten by her three daughters, Maria, Rose, and Sheena. And yes, those are the name of the three districts if you didn't actually catch on. Her blood also was drank by six noble tributes. As the Ymir and Attack on Titan created life, the Ymir belonging to Norse mythology had been known to create life in general. Mythological Ymir skin creating earth, their blood creating the sea, trees from hair and eyelashes as barricades to keep giants at bay. Pinching that specific part and pulling it into AOT, we can see that the titans themselves were used to build the barricades or walls in this case. On the topic of titans, the nine titans to be specific, we can actually see that the beaming light that forms a tree-like formation in the realm of the paths actually pretty accurately resembles Yggdrasil, the Tree of Life. Yggdrasil being used to hold the nine worlds together, much like how the paths keep hold of the nine titans. And of course, we have the tale of Ragnarok itself. Before Ragnarok had taken place, the poetic Edda spoke of world-ending giants being awoken, as well as the ancient warriors of Valhalla along with them. That and, of course, the being of Hell. Hell being listed as living under the ever-growing roots of Yggdrasil. I think that we can obviously take note here and assume that the warriors of Valhalla can be drawn to being resembled by the last titan shifters, and these, quote-unquote, world-ending giants, being the colossal titans breaking free from the walls to start the rumbling. They would say that a monster titled Jormungandr would break free during the initial ignition of Ragnarok, an enemy of the gods that is bound to them, but being destined to break free, end quote. I think that it's pretty obvious here to deduce that Eren is Jormungandr, a monster destined to break free, one you could say that will stop at nothing to attain true freedom. And on the topic of freedom alone, there is of course the meaning of 139. 139 is a number that on surface value is a sad number, right? Of course it is, that's the, the last number of Attack on Titan, that's the final chapter number. Of course that is going to be sad, however, it's also a different kind of sad, and that is where we enter the wonderful world of numerology. The number 139 when it comes to numerology is actually bound by the topic of change, the number itself dubbed as the number of the angels. Changes, unforeseen events or situations which can be drawn out at certain points and as seen as a spiritual death or a symbolic death of such. Something quite obviously difficult to accept, but in most cases this is seen as a path to evolution and understanding. However, in the rules of numerology, we can also take a glance at the number 140 that number having a rather fitting theme of meaning. Freedom, generally, is having the ability to act or change without a constraint. A person has the freedom to do things that will not, in theory or in practice, be prevented by other forces. Outside of the human realm, freedom generally does not have this political or psychological dimension, but freedom and attack on Titan is something that is very difficult or near enough impossible to overlook. The Valkyries, obviously if we take a look at their mythological state, we can see that they bear a set of wings. Of course I think it's obvious here to see what I'm trying to wrap around to, and that as the Wings of Freedom, the crest belonging to the Survey Corps in the series. But it's with these Wings of Freedom that we find out they aren't just bound to the crest on their backs. Freedom is something that we as fans, as well as Eren, have been chasing in the series for a very long time, whether it be unknowingly or, rather, perceptively. And that is being hinted through the inclusion of Falcons. Throughout Attack on Titan's runtime, we've seen a good handful of Falcons have their fair share of time in the spotlight, but it's upon obvious deduction that they've always been out of reach. I mean, because they're birds, like, they, they fly really fucking high in the sky. With birds having free reign in the skies, they have endless possibilities. These Falcons shown are not tied down by the laws of barriers or chains of captivity. They are the true embodiment of freedom in the series, whether it be as they were shown in the reflection of Eren's eye, shown as a dazed falco warned one to flee, or as it flew over a fleet of battleships, these birds were, at their true nature, 
free, but again, of course, out of the reach of characters like Eren. However, once Eren had gotten a taste of what freedom truly felt like way back in chapter 131 of the series, we see him as a boy again. This is something he had always dreamed of, being able to soar high in the sky just like the birds he spectated as a child, his arms spreading out to his side much like a bird would with its wings. However, it's of course with this taste test of sorts. It was broken, with Eren snapping back to reality as Armin called out to him. Much like this unattainable stretch of freedom, our previous talk of numerology also takes us back to this, with the numbers of 139 and 140. Remember? 139 being the meaning of true, sacrificial death, being seen as the mark of change, and 140 being the expression of freedom. It apparently represents the energy of a personal sense of freedom and self-reliance in oneself. 139 of course being just out of reach of the number 140, just like falcons had always been out of reach of Eren's grasp. The falcons and their wings being a physical representation of the wings of freedom, resulting in showing us Eren's unattainable lusts of freedom through the chapter numbers of the series themselves. But as we reach the climax of the story, our theories and speculations would finally be confirmed when it comes to this situation regarding the views of numerology, the themes of the Falcon, and the integration of the morals of freedom. Alright, I'll ask you one more time. What if all it took was just a pinch to wake up from this nightmarish bad day? What if all it took was just one sacrifice like we've talked about? It doesn't matter whether that sacrifice is considered big nor small, it's just at the end of the day, one sacrifice. One thing to lose or one rather out of place decision to make, would that change this bad day? In Attack on Titan, revisiting the very first appearance of Mikasa Ackerman is something that is very important. She's seen giving Eren a farewell, before our boy wakes up from his nightmare under the large tree he had been laying under, his initial line of questioning being, since when did your hair get so long, with tears in his eyes. And if your memory serves you fresh enough, going back to look at chapter 138 and of course taking the Ragnarok theory into serious account, we can indeed confirm that the story of Eren's journey of a lust for freedom had been indeed on a time loop. Of course, there's nothing concrete to suggest that Ragnarok was indeed destined to play out again and again, not at least until a major sacrifice had changed the fate of time anyway, but the coincidences are definitely something that, in my opinion, can't really go without being mentioned. As well as this, we see in chapter 139 Eren explaining to Armin that it was his initial plan to flatten the earth, and for it to eventually start anew, a brand new cycle to eradicate humanity's terrible, stained legacy on the earth and eventually focus on the future embitterment of the world with a new humanity. Once again, taking a look at the events of Ragnarok, we see here that quote, after these events, the world will resurface anew and fertile. The surviving and returning gods will meet and the world will be repopulated by two human survivors, end quote. While not clarifying in Attack on Titan if Eren wanted humanity to be the ones to repopulate or not, the links to both the Rumbling and Ragnarok are almost identical while reading into the intentions of both events. Seeing Eren's character fully unfold in the climax of the story, however, was something that I viewed prior as a time bomb. Ever since the series had began to get on its last legs, Eren's true intentions were going to be shown. It was really only a matter of time. Well, in the end, it was revealed that Eren fully and well knew that his genocidal acts wouldn't fully follow through as initially intended. Nothing of note really changes when it comes to his hate for the inhabitants living outside of the walls on Paradise Island, and to fully wipe out every non-Eldian to achieve his goal. That goal, of course, obviously being recognisable now as achieving freedom in its truest and purest form. Armin in this scene proceeds to ask Eren, well, why? Why continue to level the earth until you achieve these goals? And Eren can't give him a clear answer here. He can only respond to him with, I, I don't know why, I just felt like I had to do it. Giving us the explanation we need to this, funnily enough, in the same panel. Showing Grisha, the current wielder of the attack titan at that time, holding a baby Eren, telling him that he is and will always be free. 
One out of place thing to take away from this final chapter is that it still, in my eyes, validates the connection between Eren and Reiner's character. In fact, even stronger now than ever before shown in the series if we take the inclusion of their striking conversation in the basement of Marley into account. It shows now that both were hellbent on finalising their mission while simultaneously still being a human being, showing true affection to those around them even to the ones close to them that made them feel that they need to scar and hurt, whether it be physically or mentally. It's here that this conversation with Reiner and Eren finally comes to terms with the fact that they both have a strong distaste for having to continue with following these actions to reach the end of their own personal mission. Eren simply buries his realisation by simply telling Reiner the infamous line that he must keep moving forward. In the end game of it all, Eren seems to be a sad, desperate, pathetic boy who was filled with nothing but regret and simply wanted his life back. This being fully showcased by the scene showing Eren begging that Mikasa doesn't move on, that he doesn't want to die. He's practically begging to himself for a second chance to make things right, right for himself, that is. All this shown is what I mentioned to you earlier in the video here. And that is that Eren is just simply broken. He never got to express how he felt towards Mikasa in the end. Even after asking her, what am I to you, she unfortunately masked this by simply addressing him as family. He never got to truly explore the world with Armin by his side, and in the final chapter he did show him some wonders of the world as he explained his inner self to him. The final realisation that he would never be able to enjoy the rest of the time he had left with his friends. All these things in the end took a huge toll on Eren. The effects had just been growing worse and worse over time as they initially developed in their respective stages. The finale of the series showcasing the emotional distraught of Eren Yeager. The weight and the mental scarring of him having knowledge of all three timelines, past, present and future. In the end, sacrificing himself to of course break the teased loop hinted at at the beginning of the series, and letting go of that selfishness he had held onto throughout the whole entire series of Attack on Titan so that his loved ones, and their loved ones, and, you know, their loved ones of theirs and so on, could truly experience a life without shackles. A life of peace and, most fittingly, something of a semblance of freedom. Eren's story is one that the audience and the readers might not have wanted to see, but it was undoubtedly the one that had been in motion since the very beginning. And given the circumstances, it honestly makes the most sense out of all the options that could have played out. In the last few panels, showing Mikasa under the tree that it all started under, her scarf falling as she says to herself that she would like to see Eren again, and a falcon swooping in to peck and oddly fixing her scarf's position, it then soars off into the air, hinting to us that finally, after all that had happened, after all that they had gone through, and after all Eren gave, Freedom resembled that in the form of a falcon, which was finally within her and their reach. The wings of freedom soaring into the air for us to see one final time. to like actually put this in the video or not um I'll, I'll obviously find out when i find out uh it's probably gonna go on at the end to make it like like a little bit more poetic you know so i'll i'll, I'll remind myself of that when i'm editing the video but uh first off thank you for watching the video i appreciate it it means a lot i, I did put a, a good amount of work into it i will say but i want to kind of talk about my experience with attack on titan and why i kind of decided that I wanted to give the, the series such a such a big kind of farewell, I suppose. Because Attack on Titan for me is a series that has, has kind of played a really big part in, in my enjoyment of the medium, I think, of, of anime and manga. Because when it, came, when it came to Attack on Titan and how I found out about it, I think I found out about it, I, I, like... Like, you know, the, the large majority of people did. They read the... My, my bad, sorry. They, they, um, they watched the anime and they 
than read the manga, because season two, as we know, took a very, very long time to come out. <laughs> it, it did take a, quite a while to come out, and obviously, it's not a bad thing, studios and their scheduling and their, you know, their employees and stuff like that, it can be a little bit difficult, so it's understandable. But I'm recording this on the 9th of April. I just got done reading the last chapter of the series and I will probably be able to express myself a little bit better in a script, but I just want to say thank you to people like, you know, Hajime Isayama, for example, and uh, Studio Wit and Studio Mappa and Hiroyuki Sawano, because these people have made such an amazing and intricate project come to life in so many different ways. Uh, we've had video games, obviously published by Koei Tecmo, we've had some questionable live action adaptations as well, but um, I, I think the, the story of Isayama and how determined he became to, to get this story out there is really, really, it, it's quite nice to read about and quite nice to see how much he succeeded and hopefully he takes a really really long break and it's really really interesting to look at the intricacies of the anime and how Studio Wit was formed and all that and, and this whole series, this whole thing alone is nothing but a passion project on both sides with Isayama and with Studio Wit and of course with Studio Mappa as well. Um, it's, it's a passion project, and you can tell there's passion with every adaptation it gets, with every mould the story takes. It It's just raw passion at the end of the day. And with this series and, and how much of an impact it's had on, like I said, me enjoying the medium, it was the first ever manga I read purely because of my fucking impatience to stay and wait for season 2 to come out. It opened a whole new gateway for me into so many different realms and so many different stories and, and so many different, you know, tellings of different authors and stuff like that, that I can't just sit down and say Attack on Titan is a really, really good series. I think that would be an understatement, at least for me. Attack on Titan has been more than that. It's been a gateway to several other manga that I would probably never be enjoying right now if I didn't take that first step to, you know, read, you know, some manga. <laughs> Um, it, it's opened up a lot of gateways for me, and I am extremely grateful for that. I'm extremely grateful for Hajime Isayama, and I'm extremely thankful for Studio Wet for even putting Attack on Titan on the map for me personally, and for a lot of other people as well. And I, um, I hope Mappa really, really succeeds in what they're doing as well. I, I think MAPA are getting hated on way too much, and I think they're doing an amazing job for the, the amount of time that they were given. Uh, so yeah, I just wanted to slip this in. I don't really know if I'm going to actually include this or not, maybe, we'll see. But, yeah, thank you, Hajime Isayama, for giving us such an amazing and well thought out and... Uh, Honestly, a series I would I would lightly call a masterpiece. I, I think you've, it's it's I think he's definitely put himself up there with the greats, at least in my opinion. Anyway, so yeah, thank you, Studio Wit. Thank you, Studio Mappa. Thank you, um, Hiroyuki Salmano as well for the amazing soundtrack. And of course, thank you, Hajime Isayama. <laughs>